Hallelujah. Praise God. In the name of Jesus. Amen. The book of Revelation, chapter number two. Hallelujah. God is good. He's so good. Beginning at verse number 12. Revelation 2, he says, And to the angel of the church in Pergamos, write, These things saith he which hath the sharp sword with two edges. I know thy works, and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. And thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith. Even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you, where Satan dwelleth. But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. And the word of the Lord is already blessed. God bless you. You may be seated. Amen. As we praise God for his word. I want to encourage you, as much as your schedule would allow it, uh, to come and join us on Wednesday nights in Bible study. On Wednesday night, we, we do a full exposition of this letter, if you will. We discuss the background and the author and, and the audience, and we get into a lot more detail. On Sunday morning, uh, we just get a quick glimpse, amen, and we extract from this letter a specific word, amen, to minister to the church. Uh, but if you really want to get the details and get the right teaching, from this text, uh, you're going to need more than a 20, 30 minute sermon. You, you, you ought to pull some time aside out of your schedule if the Lord allows uh, whenever you can and, and come out on Wednesday night as we're going through this study. This, this church at Pergamos, uh, Pergamos this, this, another, this was another wealthy city, if you will. Um, won't say a whole lot about the city. I would encourage you to get the handout. We have a, a deeper study attached to it. You can find out about it. But I would let you know uh, that, that this city was, was the heart of idolatry. There was more than one temple worship there. And one unique thing about this city is this was the first city that had gotten approval to worship a living human being in the person of seizure. And they, matter of fact, it got so bad that they built a temple for him also, and people would go there to worship the governor, the emperor, if you will. That's when he, all, he became almost like a god himself. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes. This, this city, they, they had a 200,000 volume library. Don't mean a whole lot until you recognize that they had to write handwrite every single book, every single page. It was a very impressive place, full of intellect, full of, uh, of religious idolatry, amen. But what the real problem that God had, so, so at any rate, with a city like this, you know that it had to be difficult for Christians. It was a dangerous place for a Christian to live. And so Jesus came, he came to his church that was located in this mess, and he spoke from his heart. He said, y'all surrounded by devils. You're at the seat of Satan. And, and he comes to them, and the way he, the Bible calls this one, this description, is the one that has a two-edged sword. If you remember when we studied, when John turned around, y'all remember when we talked about, have you seen him lately? And John said, when I saw him, and he fell dead, y'all, but, but, but the, the description John gave, he saw a man that had eyes like fire, feet like brass, the first and the last. He gave a lot of descriptions of Christ, and one of them was a double-edged sword coming out of his mouth. So each time a letter is written, Christ uses one of those glorified descriptions to say who the letter is coming from. And it's amazing because every problem the church had, that was the description. The remedy for that church came through the description. In other words, this church needed a word. That This church needed the word of God to be clear. And so that's why he spoke as the holder of a two-edged sword coming out of his mouth. So he comes with the truth. And power of his word. 
speak to this church and he comes to encourage the faithful and to exterminate the foolish if you will but because the word will divide you know that don't you the word has a way of dividing and the word will destroy foes on both hands and the bible says and pierce the heart so i want to listen in as as jesus he speaks to them and he speaks to us amen to this early church and there's a few things I want to break down, if we could just kind of break down this conversation that he has with them, because the first, the thing I want to talk to you about is a tainted testimony. That's my, my, my topic this morning. Uh, what we learn about this church is that they had a tainted testimony. Let's, let's observe the letter. The first thing he speaks to, he talks about their testimony in and of itself. Look at verse 13. In verse 13, he says, I know thy works, and look at what he says, and where thou dwellest even where Satan's seat is look now what he's describing y'all is a difficult testimony everybody said it was difficult look, look at what he said he he says I know what you're doing right and I know where you dwell I know where you are it was a dangerous place the Bible says Satan's seat is there now I want y'all to hear this because first Peter 5 and 8 reminds us that the devil is not in hell Tell your name, the, the devil is not in hell. I know what the cartoons say. I know what Tom and Jerry say. Every time one of them get mad, the devil come up out of hell and sit on their shoulder and go back down to hell. But you need to know the devil is not in hell. You don't believe me, do you? First Peter chapter 5, verse 8 puts it like this. He says, be sober, be vigilant. Why? Because your adversary, your enemy, the one, your accuser, he says, the devil, he says, he's like a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour somebody say the devil's right here you better believe it he is right here well and that's why jesus he said in the letter he says i know where you dwell i know what you have to put up with and it's not that they were going to satan's house but satan has showed up at their house isn't it amazing when you try to do right all oh, you just you stay away from the wrong people Stay away from the wrong places. Stop hanging out in places you used to hang out. Stop hanging around people you used to hang around. And the devil show up at your church. The devil come and clock in on your job. The devil mess around and move in next door to you. Sometimes you can do the best you can to avoid the devil. And the devil will come and find you. He said, I know where you dwell. I see where you are. I need to, I'm trying to move on, but I need you to understand that he knows, he sees exactly where you are. Notice the word. He said, I know where you dwell. I know where you live. I see what you got to put up with because Satan, y'all, he, he's roaming. He's the prince of this world, John 12, 31. This was Satan's stronghold. And what God wants you to understand is that while he's the prince of the air, he calls the believers to go on the offense and not the defense. Because when you're in the enemy's territory, you don't go in the enemy's camp and go on defense. Are y'all listening to me? If I'm going to go on the enemy's camp, I better go ready to do something. If I ain't going to do nothing, then I need to get out of his camp. But guess what? We're, not, we're in this world, but we're not of this world. So you can't run from the devil. Amen. And some people got this context. Well, if I can't beat him, I might as well what? Y'all know it when you get defeated, what we do? Join him. As soon as our temper get touched the wrong way, join him. As soon as we get tired of our evil being a good, our good being evil spoken of, or our kindness being turned around, people do evil for our good. When people take advantage of you, that's our way. We just mess around and join him. But the devil is a lie. God said, I know where you're at, but I expect you to be on the offense because they live in a place beyond their circumstances. Where you dwell is where Satan dwells. You know what that reminded me of? That God is calling us to be thermostats and not thermometers. Y'all know the difference, don't you? I love talking about it with couples. He, 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 that's why he said, I know where you dwell. I put you there. Stop running from the job and running from the community and running from this and running from that. I put you there and you're standing there being a thermometer when I told you to be a thermostat. Because a thermometer will tell you what the temperature is, but the thermometer won't do nothing about the temperature. If it gets hot, the thermometer just says it's hot. And it just sit there and say it's still hot. It's getting hotter. And the thermometer don't change anything but a thermostat. A thermostat will say it's hot and let me adjust this thing and cool it off a little bit. A thermostat not only reads the temperature, but a thermostat changes the atmosphere. And that's what I believe God called these believers to do. I know where you dwell, and that's why I expect you to, somebody say, change the atmosphere. 
Change it, man. Change it. He knows where he places us. He knows where he wants us to be. So, so he acknowledges their testimony that it was a difficult testimony. They were in a dangerous place. And look at what he says, y'all. Look at how he commends them as he goes through. He, he says, y'all held on to my name. Although I know where you dwell, I know where seated. He, he, he acknowledges that you're at Satan's seat. But they held on to my name. They exalted Jesus, and, and that's God's plan for us. That's why in John 12, 32, he said, and I, if I be lifted up, he says, I will draw all men unto me. Anybody ever read the word before? So, so his, his point is, when you hold on to my name, somebody say, that's a good testimony. You got to get this. That's a good testimony. He said they did not deny the faith, amen. They held on to his fundamentals. They, they, there was a great need, y'all, for Christians to stand, to hold on to the foundation of Christianity. Most of us in our community tend to be voting Democrats. We tend to allow politics to drive our decisions. But the truth of the matter is there is no liberalism in God's word. The only liberalism is being set free from the hands of the enemy. That, that's where I liberal. We, we are liberal in that regard, but sometimes, y'all, especially in political language, politics call liberalism more different than what the Bible calls it. The Bible tells us that we are set free. The Bible says that chains are broken, but when politics tell you to be liberal, politics tell you to be walk contrary to God's word. To politics, liberal means men marry men, women marry women. You can kill a baby and it doesn't matter. But in politics, uh, common law marriages are more important than a commitment to God. And, and politics being liberal means do whatever feels right. But God has a standard. Let me say that again. I say God has a standard. There's a standard that every believer should live by, that God calls us to live by. And when we start mixing that standard when we start putting the wrong thing in the mix, now you are de you're embarking on tainting your testimony. Let me talk to you for a minute. Th this, this thing was, uh, he said, y'all didn't, y'all held on to my name. You didn't deny the faith. Matter of fact, a brother was even willing to die. He talked about this young man, Antipas. He was, he was willing to die. He was martyred. And, and, and it was interesting. We learned this in Bible study that the root word for martyr in the Greek means the same thing as witness. In other words, the early believers that were witnesses for Jesus Christ knew very well that they were witnessing of their willingness to die for Christ. It meant as long as I'm a Christian and I step out and say I'm a Christian, I'm saying that I'm willing to do whatever. I'm willing to take whatever come with this walk. I'm, I'm willing to die for what I believe in. Their testimony was difficult, y'all. It, it was difficult, and he, he commends them for holding on with such a difficult testimony. Is there anybody here that can reflect on a difficult testimony? That, that can say, I love him, but Lord, I had to get through some st stuff to get to where I am today. Somebody that says, I'm mature now, but I ain't always been like this. Anybody like me had to go through a test more than one time for, for you to get it? And, and, and I, I thought I was testifying when I used to talk about what I went through until I had to go through it again and again. And I learned that I really wasn't testifying. I was just confessing. Oh, y'all y'all don't know what I'm talking about. It, it's because some of you cannot begin to comprehend the testimony of some of the people you're sitting next to. I know because I've been blessed with the opportunity to minister to many of you. And there's some folk you sit next to, they have no clue. They have no idea what God has brought you through because the reality is we all have a unique story. Don't let nobody fool you. Amen. And the unique thing about this testimony was not what they were going through. But what was unique, it was the fact that they kept the faith in spite of Satan's stronghold. What are you saying, Pastor? If Christ is not exalted and the believer is not grounded with the willingness to be slain for his sake, there is no testimony. Let me be honest with you. Don't call it a testimony when you cried all night, cursed somebody out, put your religion down, had to step back for a while, lost your cool, almost lost your mind, was depressed, disgusted, and defeated, but Jesus brought me out. No, no, that's called a confession. That means I'm admitting that I lost my cool. That, and then don't get me wrong, I do believe that confession is good for the soul, but a testimony requires that you do what God's word commands you to do. Rejoice in the Lord, all ye people. Oh, clap your hands, all ye people. The joy of the Lord is your strength. 
What does he tell me to do? Ephesians chapter 6 verse 13 puts it real plain. He says, wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God. Why do I need the whole armor? He says that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all, I wish I had a Bible reader here. Y'all playing with me. In other words, what? let me tell y'all something. The testimony is not complaining all the way through. That's confession. That's good for us. Now, that's good. That's confession. That means, yes, I was angry. Y'all have heard me. I done confessed plenty of times. I, yeah, I was angry. I almost lost it. And, and it's always a story of God bringing me out. But you know what keeps happening? And I, it took me a minute to learn this, Brother Doug. I keep testifying. I call myself testifying. But what kept happening is the same test kept coming up. Came and God kept testing me because he wanted my confession to change from confession to testimony. Because confession is, oh, man, they tried me on the road, and, man, I got so angry, and I didn't pull the trigger, but I pulled out the gun. Oh, man, they tried me on the road, and I didn't say it, but it crossed my mind. That's a confession. There's no testimony in that. Are y'all listening to me? The fact that God kept you from hurting somebody, that God stepped in and, and stopped it from going on, praise God, that's a testimony for him, but that ain't your testimony. That's your confession that next time I get that angry, I pray that I can love them. The next time I get that angry, I pray that I don't need God to come and rescue me from myself. But at some point, these fundamentals, this word, the knowing Jesus Christ has got to make an impact on my life. I hope I ain't hurt nobody's feelings, but stop fooling yourself. Amen. And learn the difference between a confession and a testimony. Confession is good. I say confession is good. But, but they overcame, not by the confession, but what? By the word of their testimony, the fact that they lasted. That, not the fact that God rescued them from their self, but at some point the word stuck. And at some point it was the word that held me down as opposed to my guilt and shame holding me down. I wish I had a praying church. He, he says, stand. And the fact is, these believers held fast to their testimony. But can I be honest with y'all? The problem was not their testimony. That, that wasn't the issue in this letter. The problem was their tolerance. Are y'all listening to me? I, I said the problem wasn't their testimony. He acknowledged, y'all had a good testimony. They, the, these people held fast. They, they lifted his name in spite of, but, but there was a certain degree of tolerance. And for many of us, many of us, the issue is not our testimony, it's our tolerance. It's the other stuff we put up with, the stuff that we allow in to taint the testimony. You, you, you lift up God's name and we exalt him and we get through in that regard, but then we let some other stuff go on that we don't check. Look at what it says, Revelation verse 14. He says, but I have a few things against thee because thou hast there them. Y'all got them there. That, that hold the doctrine of Balaam who taught Balaam. Let, let, let me tell you a little bit about uh, this, this story about Balaam. Amen. Uh, Balaam was a, was a very well-known prophet in the Old Testament. If you study the book of Numbers somewhere around chapter 22 through 24, you, you'll find out that there was another king that was next door uh, to the Israelites, and his name uh, was Balak. And, and he called on, he hired this prophet to curse the people of Israel. This story blessed me so much. Some of y'all ought to just thank God for this one because what, what the, the end of the story, the bottom line was everything this prophet tried to do, he could not curse the people of God to the point that he had to go back to the king and say, man, God has blessed them and I can't reverse it. Y'all listen to me. He said, when God blesses somebody, there's nothing I can do to curse them. I can't reverse the blessings of God. Somebody ought to just give God praise for that in and of itself. Amen. The fact that it just... Even if I don't deserve the blessing, it can't be reversed. So, so he said, listen, there's nothing I can do. God has blessed these people. The doors that God has opened, I can't close them. The doors that God has closed, I can't open them. I'm a powerful prophet, but I ain't that powerful. He said, there's nothing, I can't touch them. So they came up with an evil plan. And the plan that they came up with is, since I can't curse them, since you can't curse them, let's make them curse themselves. And that happens so often in our lives when the attacks from the outside don't work. When, when the people on the job can't discourage you or the things around you can't get the best of you, then what the enemy will do will cause you to turn against yourself. I know I ain't the only one in here. Amen. 
And, and so the, what this plan was is what they decided to do is instead of them trying to curse them, let's send the women in there. And they sent the Moabite women to infiltrate the camp and to get the men to sleep with them so that they would mix their seed. And by mixing their seed, now they developed this unholy union, if you will. And they were absolutely, they created a nation of people that were unequally yoked, not favoring God. Are y'all listening to me? And, and, and as, so that was the plan. And, and with that plan, what they did now is they had a mixed religion. They were still worshiping God. They would leave the temple of God. They were still following what the law of Moses said. But then they would violate the same law because they was married to it now. Are y'all listening to me? They had them connected. They had little, little, little evil babies. Amen. They, they had, the, are y'all listening? Just, just wickedness, just, just permeating all through the neighborhood. I wish somebody could understand where I'm coming from. So, so in that, in, in, in that problem, what, what God is trying to show them is the same thing that happened back then. He made reference to that. And what God is showing them is that, first of all, the biggest problem with your tolerance is you have corruption in the membership. Are y'all listening to me? Oh, y'all messing. Y li li be because, look at what he says. Because you have them there. That's what the Bible says. You, you have them there and you know it. You got something going on in your life and you know it. You have something going on in your church and you know it. You have them there. And you're hurting your testimony, not because you're not uplifting my name, but you're tolerating too much stuff around you. You have connected with something that I did not connect you with. You have them there. I wish the Lord would speak a word to St. Peter's this morning. Speak a word to Robert Brooks. Speak a word to every individual. Watch out for the corruption in your membership. Help me, Holy Ghost. You have them there. What have you put in your mind? What have you put in your heart? What thoughts are you going to sleep on? What are you listening to when you lay down? What are you watching when you get up? You have them there. Yes, you're in church on Sunday morning. Yes, you're still praising my name. But where are you going when you leave here? You have them there. He said there was a corruption in the membership. And if you really want to overcome, somebody say cut out the corruption. You got to cut out the corruption. See, the problem with corruption is corruption, in my opinion, is worse than all out wickedness. Why? Because corruption is a mix. When there's corruption in politics, that means there's some good ones and there's some bad ones. When there's corruption on the police force, that means you got some good cops and some bad cops. And when there's some corruption in the church, you got somebody that's living for Jesus and somebody that's living for the world. And you know what makes it worse in this case? It's somebody that's trying to do both. There was corruption, y'all. In the membership and that means that in this church there were false teachers and in this church y'all there were people that truly didn't follow God they had a front and in this particular church right here he said you have them there that and those people that you have there are down with that unholy alliance there those people that you have there and you know it remember he wrote the letter to the angel of the church and I don't know what membership I'm talking to remember I told y'all this letter is twofold what is it saying to you personally I understand what it's saying corporately. It's saying that, listen, if you're going to worship me, and if you're going to worship in a body together, that means what is this saying to St. Peter's? Don't make sure you don't let any activity corrupt your membership. Don't, don't play with God like that. If it ain't real, you need to cut it out right then and there. If it's not lifting him up, if it's lifting up somebody else, somebody says it's got to be cut out. If there's backbiting and lying going on, it's got to be cut out. If every time you leave church, you got to have a one-hour gospel session, somebody say cut it out. Cut it out, man. Cut it out. If you sniggling and gossiping and instead of building somebody else, cut it out. Everything we do has got to be true to the word of God. He said you have them there. As a matter of fact, if somebody you close to is doing it, you got to tell them to cut it out too. But then look in the mirror at your own life. He says you have them there. You're, you're tolerating things that you shouldn't tolerate. We're all going to go through temptation. Everybody has challenges in their own personal lives. The problem that he has is not the temptation, not the challenge, but the tolerance. When, 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 when the temptation comes so heavy and you just get tired of being tempted, you just, this is just going to be my struggle. And you just kind of give up and just let that thing just get the best of you. And then instead of it being an attack, it starts to take up residence. Instead of it being a moment of weakness, it becomes a lifestyle. Am I talking to somebody this morning? You, you, he says you have them there. You, you've allowed too much to go on for too long. You, you've, you've tolerated it too long. You've put up with it too long. You've gone to sleep angry, woke up angry. Somebody know what I'm talking about. He, you got to deal with the corruption. Cut 
out the corruption. I was going to give y'all some history, but you don't need all that. Just cut, cut it out. Cut out the corruption because that wasn't the only problem. Not, not only was there corruption in the membership, but there was confusion in the leadership. He, he says, not only do you have them there, not only that, that problem in verse 14, but, but then he also says, you, you got leaders. He, look, look at what he says in, in his next verse. He, he says in verse number 15, so hast thou also them that hold the doctrine. Now he's talking about leadership of the Nicolaitans, the which thing I also hate. When, see, there, there, were, there were clergy that was teaching this foolishness. There was leadership that was teaching this doctrine. And the problem is when there's corruption in the membership and confusion in the leadership, the church could grow. People could join. And it become very popular, but God won't be glorified. Are y'all listening to me? And, and so we got to make sure that what's being taught has to be the unadulterated truth, the doctrine of God. Amen. As a matter of fact, their, their doctrine taught that the clergy was like a God because that's what was going on in society. That's why I'm so adamant against that, that man worship thing. Amen. You got to know how to respect a man without worshiping a man. You got to know how he tells us to honor those that rule. Amen. And I praise God for that. I honor my leadership, but don't you dare get caught up in worshiping. Are y'all listening to me? Because that results in confusion, y'all. And, and the confusion is who is really God. When we get confused and get, forget who's really running this thing, who's, who, who the instructions are really coming from, are y'all walking with me? So, so, so you got everybody say clear up the confusion. So once we cut out the corruption and clear up the confusion, look at what comes from, from the headship. Now there's a command and the command is repent. It's been the same story to every letter. Every letter he says, repent. And y'all know I say it every week. When you repent, that means just go the other direction. How do I repent of corruption? Go the other direction. You've been tolerating it. Start stepping to it. If there's something in your life that's been plaguing you, instead of you tolerating, address it. If you have an anger problem, confront it. If you have an immorality problem, confront it. If lust is your issue, lying is your issue, confront it. If, you're, if you got a problem with putting your hands on stuff that don't belong to you, you got to confront that thing. You, you've got, in other words, when you confront it, you literally go the other direction. I could steal this and get away with it. But, but instead, I'm going to go and bless somebody. I used to steal. I, I did. I used to did when I was young, for real. I did. But you know what? I'm going to tell you how, and I can say this, y'all, because I'm going to tell you what repentance do. Now, I'm probably one of the biggest givers. God has just got me in a place, and it's natural. But, but, but that's the way I had to undo that stealing. If you want to undo stealing, don't just stop stealing because you're going to go and steal again. But if you want to undo it, you got to do something in the complete opposite direction. In other words, give to somebody even if you feel like they don't deserve it. Be, be a blessing to someone because what thieves do is take what don't belong to them. So in other words, you ought to just start releasing. Start, somebody say, go the other direction. If, if lust is your issue, go the other direction. Confront that thing. Call it out. Because let me tell you something, man. Once you start embarrassing yourself, you'll stop lusting. If, if you start confessing some things, let me tell you how to stop lusting, brothers, how to stop messing up. Tell your wife. Tell on yourself. Y'all think I'm playing. Go the other direction. Because when you cutting up, don't nobody know. Amen. It's the biggest secret. You ain't going to tell her anything. But when you repent, don't just stop calling that girl and stop visiting. Go tell on yourself. I bet you won't do it no more. Y'all looking at me funny. Some of y'all ain't ready to repent. You got to go. I'm, I'm dead serious. I'm, I'm, I wish my wife was here. I'll tell on myself, but she ain't here, so I'm going to keep moving. Amen. I know you're watching online. Amen. L listen, you got to go the other. That, that's all he's saying. He's saying repent, and that's how you deal with corruption. Because corruption is this underhanded, secret foolishness that go on. And God is saying, go the other direction. Whatever you're dealing with, you've got to be able to admit the corruption is in me. My members are all jacked up. My leadership is all jacked up. My mind is the one going where it ought to not go. Repent. Help me, Holy Ghost. I'm going to talk to somebody in here. you you got to be able to call out your own stuff. Whatever your stuff is and whatever temptation you find yourself leaning to, go the other direction, the complete, not a little bit, not, not a 360. Don't, don't worry it down. Don't just stop doing something. Don't, well, I ain't going to do that no more. No, you got to add some action to the thing that you stop doing. Because if you just stop 
and don't do anything else, what you going to do the moment you face trouble, the moment the fire get hot again, hot again you're going to pick it back up right where you left it. Oh, y'all listening to me. But when you put it down and go another direction, guess what's going to happen? If I get weak and I start to fall, thank you, sister, it's behind me. And matter of fact, if I need something to pick up, it ain't here for me to pick it up. And if I'm walking in the Word, the only thing I got to pick up when I get weak is the Word. Come on and give God praise in this place. They had a tainted, a tainted testimony. And the truth is, man, he, he says, repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly, verse 16, and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. See, Jesus owns the church, but he disowns compromise. Am I making sense to you? He, he loves us, but he don't love compromise. And, and you can't live in sin and hide in the church because God will fight against those who hinder the church's testimony. That's why Balaam, he was killed by the sword because God is not going to have any man or anything that taints his testimony. And the truth is the only thing that can set things in order is the word. And that's why he said, I'm coming with the sword of my mouth. And it's amazing, y'all, because the only thing that can give you orders from the commander-in-chief is the word. But the word comforts, but the word also judges. And can I tell you something? You don't want to fight against the sword of his mouth because you're going to lose every time. The, the same word that can build you up can chop you down. The same word that promises eternal life promises eternal tor torment. And don't fight against the word of God. Somebody say, follow the command. So, so, so we, 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 we got to cut out the corruption, clear up the confusion, and just follow his command. And as I hastened to close, I was so blessed because he didn't just talk about their, their, their testimony. He, he, he didn't just talk about their tolerance, but he wanted them to understand that if you follow my word, if you trust my word, if you follow the command, he had to say a word about their triumph. And I like what he said because in my Bible, yours says the same. He says, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna. And, he will, and will give him a white stone and in the stone a new name written which no man knoweth saving he that receiveth it. We touched on this a little bit on the first Sunday as we celebrated with the survivors, but I want to say a little bit about that hidden manna, that sweet bread, those, those sweet cakes that, that God provided. Remember when the people uh, in Exodus 16, when the people were out in the wilderness and while they were wandering, they had no resources and all they know is that they woke up in the morning and every morning that they woke up, there was manna all over the place. There was manna all on the ground and, and what God told them to do, he told them to just eat what they needed and gather it up. Don't overdo it because I'm going to take care of you. Don't, don't overdo it. And can I tell y'all something, man? God has resources that you haven't even seen. And you don't recognize it until you overcome. And some of us are trying to find out remedies and, and conclusions and how to figure it out. And all God is saying is just overcome first. If you just overcome, I can help the ends meet. I can help the bills get paid. I can help where there's been a void, but you got to overcome. Because when you overcome, you won't need who you think you need. You won't have to do what you think you got to do. But somebody said you got to overcome. And, and when you overcome, I love what he promises because his promise really sums up with favor. And I don't know about you, but if you don't need anything else in this world, it's, I know I need favor with God. If I got favor with God, I can handle anything else. Amen. He, he says, I have hidden manna, hidden blessing, something that you haven't seen before. How do I know it's a hidden blessing? How do I know God is blessing me with hidden manna? Well, one of the ways I know is when it's just enough. Not, 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 I'm on, not that I'm broke, not that I'm poverty stricken, but, but it's enough to keep me grounded. It's more than enough. To, it's enough to keep me from feeling low. And, it's, and it's, it's less enough to keep me from getting the big head. Somebody say hidden blessings. It, it's just what I need. It, it provides, I don't have to compromise myself. I don't need no more than this. He done hooked me up. Somebody know something about some hidden manna. Amen. When you ain't even got to call sugar daddy, sugar mama, you ain't got to lie on no paperwork. No, you're not driving the fanciest car. You're not wearing the fanciest clothes, but you ain't looking broke. You're doing pretty good. Somebody say hidden blessings. And people trying to figure out how you work there and you able to buy this. Oh, God, somebody say hidden blessings. How you by yourself in a single family home and you living like that. Somebody say 
Oh, I wish somebody know something about some. How you got all them children, Brooks, and you still doing all right? Somebody say, hidden blessings. I wish anybody was in, unemployed, but God still got you through. And he didn't just get you through, but he hooked you up in the process. It's something about when God's favor is on your life. Because when God do it, you don't have to compromise to make it. Somebody lost their job and they had to go back to their old ways to make it. Somebody went through a, a tough time and they had to go back to some old gangster stuff to make it. Amen. I thank God that I don't have to go back. That I can stay right where I am and get blessed better than I did when I was doing wrong. Somebody say hidden manna. Hidden manna. Amen. Not only is it just enough, but it comes from unusual sources. When it's hidden manner, you don't have room to boast or brag. When it's hidden manner, you're not getting a pat on the back. All you can do is say to God, be the glory. When, when it's hidden manner, when it's hidden manner, it's unmerited and undeserved. You don't have to work for it. You didn't earn it. You can't even look at a reference point and say, I did this, so God did that. When it's hidden manner, all you can do is just see the blessing and say, I don't know why he did it. I don't know where he came from. I didn't deserve it. I didn't earn it. But God keeps blessing me. Somebody say hidden manner. When it's hidden manner, not only is it undeserved, not only is it unusual, not only is it just enough, but it's timely. You ever been to where you were right at the brink of a breakdown? You were right there, and if he didn't come through today, it was going to be the end. Uh, anybody know what I'm talking about? And he'll step in right on time for these people every morning. They went to bed with an empty refrigerator but woke up with it full. Every morning, God is a timely God. He said, if you're overcome, I'll step in right on time. Hidden manner. In the other way, God expressed his favor. He expressed his favor through the hidden manner. But then he said a word. He said, I'm going to give all of you a white stone. I told you to them that overcome, every description he gave was a description of favor. He used different ways to describe you have found favor with God. And God, I wish I could express it. I can't even put the words together to express how valuable the favor of God is. Because we live in this world and circumstances are going to come, challenges are going to come, you're going to have some good and bad. He reigns on the just as well as the unjust. But there's nothing that underscores the favor of God. Because when you got the favor of God, there's no circumstance that can defeat you. You can go through anything, but God's favor is going to hold you up. If you overcome, God says, I promise you my favor, first of all, by giving you hidden manna. And the second way is by giving you a white stone. Because that white stone, it has some meanings. We learned about it in Bible study, but I'm going to just give it to you real quick. That white stone, how does that white stone represent God's favor? Well, historically, the first way the white stone was used, I told you all a few Sundays ago, is that it represented acquittal. The judge used to have a black stone and a white stone to determine if a person was guilty or not. And as opposed to hitting the gavel, they would fill up the jar with stones. And when they turn the jar over, the person would see what the outcome is. And what God is saying, he's reminding us, is that when you met Jesus, you had a jar full of black stones. And what he did without any merit of yours is he replaced all of your stones. That now when your stuff is called out, all you're going to see is acquitted. Somebody say acquitted. That means no matter what I've done, I am acquitted. God has given you favor in the courtroom. Not only favor. Favor, not only does it represent acquittal, but the white stone represents victory. That means when folks, when they won, the winner of the Olympic Games would receive a white stone. And this white stone would give them access to all of the other entertainment. Somebody say it also represents victory. Now, not only does it represent acquittal and victory, but the white stone represents citizenship. In that time when a person went to a new city, when they were a citizen of that city, they received a white stone. That white stone showed what city that they were a part of. And what he's trying to tell you is I'm giving you citizenship in heaven. I don't know about you, but I thank God for favor. And the last thing that really blessed my heart with that white stone is that it represents friendship. I don't know about you, but I'm a friend of God. And in that friendship, what would happen is friends would each carry a white stone with the name of their friend written on him. And Jesus says, listen, I want to be your friend. That in fact, at, at, at dinner, that sometimes when folks had dinner, when you had a dinner invitation, you would receive a white stone with your name on it. That means when you came to the door with the stone, you got access. The point that I want you to get is what God says is if you overcome, if you just get through it, hold on to my name. Repent. 
Turn around. Go the other direction. He says, I promise favor over your life. And no politics, no economy, no paycheck, no raise, no promotion could ever replace the favor of God. So don't taint your testimony, my brothers and sisters. And if you find that you've tainted your testimony, that all you need is the one with the double-edged sword. The word of God. Speak God's word over your life. And maybe you're like these other believers. The ones that have a testimony. That although it's a difficult testimony. He says, I know where you dwell. I know where you are. I know what's around you. And he's not, he, he's not in hell. But he's roaming to and fro. And no, it's not your imagination. The devil is busy. The devil goes to church. The devil works on jobs. The devil is in communities because the Bible called him the prince of the air. And anytime we confront the devil, we don't have to go on the defense. We go on the, the offense. We put on the whole armor of God. And I want to encourage every believer in here to be real about the corruption in your environment. Be real about the corruption in your membership, the confusion in your leadership, so that we can get a command from the headship. Repent. Turn that thing around and watch how God lift you up. Let's give God praise in this place.